Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. Tonight I'm going to be having a discussion about the brightness of Venus. So in a recent video I did, I measured the brightness of the planet Venus relative to the moon. And uh, earlier today, Higher Truth Channel posted the following video uh, disputing my video and my calculations. So first of all, let me share uh, that video so that we can take a look at what he says and see if we can address his concerns with my measurements and calculations. Remember when? Remember when the crescent moon, you could not see the rest of the moon? All right, sorry, I'm going to stop it there for a moment and just address this right off the bat. And I apologize, whenever I pause it, it's going to take me a moment to reconfigure the audio here so that uh, I can start speaking again and you guys can hear me. And uh, basically, he's complaining about Earthshot. Uh, in the photo I took for a photometry of Venus and comparing it to the moon, if you look closely at the moon, you'll notice you can see past uh, the lunar terminator. You can see the darkened portion of the moon here. And this is normal. This is called Earth shine. And this is because the moon is actually reflecting the Earth's light. So it is literally Earth shine. If you were standing on this part of the moon, looking up in the sky, you would see Earth reflecting tons of light from the sun, and the Earth would be mostly full. When the, when the moon is a thin crescent like this, from the perspective of an observer sitting on the moon's surface looking back at Earth, they see a mostly full Earth. So that's a lot of light, and that light is reflected off the moon's surface, and we can actually see that dimly in the image here. That's normal. Uh, I'm not sure why he's claiming that's something new, but it certainly isn't. And if you want, if you guys are, are you know, really interested in that, I can pull up old photos from many decades ago showing that phenomenon. In fact, one particular picture comes to mind right away from an old, old issue of uh, Sky and Telescope. In fact, I th think I actually have that. Uh, on my YouTube channel, sitting as, a, as an unlisted video just laying around, uh, because it, it's an interesting photo for a number of reasons. One, because it's documented proof of Earthshine, which I never thought I'd have to actually prove, but uh, two, it also shows a somewhat tilted moon, kind of like what you're seeing here, where the uh, moon's terminator is uh, not vertical. So, yes, this was a this was a cover, uh, a cover of Sky and Telescope from 1961, as it turns out. And let's see. Okay, yeah. Let me pull this over here. I'm gonna pull this link over here. It's gonna have to. I'm gonna have to turn off the 3D. I recorded this a while ago on a uh, on a cell phone I had that had 3D camera on the back. And uh, I turned on the 3D sort of as a, as a greater proof that I wasn't faking anything here. I wasn't Photoshopping or editing this video in some way to fake this cover. Uh, but you can see here, I put it on 2D just so it, it's, you know, clear for everyone to see. And you can see Earthshine on the moon on this cover, which you can see it's stamped. It, it's in the library at the University of South Florida, and they received it March 1st, 1961. So quite an old photo of uh, the moon and Earthshine. And that's, you know, quite normal when the moon is a thin crescent like that. So well, that's addressed now. Uh, let's move on to the rest of the video and get to the meat of the argument here. Remember when the background sky was black, like that, yellow, crane. Oh, the sun is bright to tell us. I'm resentful. I just spent a half hour listening to Astronomy Live website.
trying to tell us and figure out if Venus is really brighter, the moon is really brighter. I mean, we all know the sun is brighter, right? We used to color the sun in first grade in kindergarten using what? A yellow crayon. One guy called in, wrote in, and said he got in trouble for using a white crayon when he was in kindergarten because the sun was yellow. So he had to go find a yellow crayon to color a picture of the sun. It's that simple. And things that reflect the sun, the moon, the planets, they're brighter too, in spite of a persistent layer of haze that tries to obstruct some of that light. And a guy pulls out an old astronomy book and does all the quadratic equations and logarithms and angles of this and, and ratios of distance. Wow. Okay. The guy's smarter than me, huh? And then to prove that the old astronomy book is the same today as it was yesterday in terms of the apparent magnitude of the brightness of these objects, he pulls out a personal photograph. You tell me that's scientific, huh? And all of these photographs that I'm showing you on this video, please, if you took them, please attach a link to your photography site. You guys are amazing photographers all over the world. Um, but every single one of these is better quality than the photograph he was using. Puts it in, paints it in to an app that measures the brightness of the object in your photograph, an object which is pinpoint, by the way, and of poorer quality than anything you're going to see on this video. And that app tells you that the apparent magnitude of the little pinpoint on your photograph is not identical, but similar to what the old astronomy book said that hmm, Venus and the moon are supposed to be. I submit that person will not take his family out in the bright, clear, blue sky and lay his family out in the sun all day long. I mean, it's solar minimum. You shouldn't need a whole lot of SPF of anything. All right. So for purposes of fair use here, I'm not going to use this entire video, but I had to play a large chunk of it there because we need to go through this. So I'm going to take things a little out of order here just to address the little comment he threw in there at the end about the sun. And I've never heard this claim before that when the sun's at solar minimum, it should be safe to lay out in the sun for hours on end. That's never been true, especially here in Florida. I remember getting burned quite badly a couple times as a kid because I wasn't wearing proper sunscreen or being in Florida, going to the beach and spending all day in the water uh, and not using a sunscreen that's quite uh, hydrophobic enough. It, you know, washes off eventually and you still get burned. So, you know, that's always been the case. And it doesn't matter where, where you are in the solar cycle. UV light is still going to be there and it's still going to be intense whether there's sunspots or not. And so it's not safe to lay out in the sun for hours, whether you're at solar minimum or solar maximum. I mean, I I don't know where that comes from. I don't know why he thinks that, but that's never been the case. So, you know, safety tip here, don't lay out in the sun without proper sunscreen for hours on end. Yeah, that's, that's a good safety tip right there. Um, in terms of his complaints about my photo and his complaints about how I'm measuring its brightness and comparing it to, you know, an old book and documented evidence of how bright Venus is expected to be, not based on what modern programs are saying or what NASA is saying, but on an equation that predates the very existence of NASA, let alone computers that we have today, let alone programs that we use today, etc. cetera. Uh, he claims, you know, photos like this one are better quality than my photo. Well, I mean, I guess there's a certain aesthetic appeal here, but I beg to differ as far as photometry is concerned. So coming back to my photo again, and this is, this is my photo loaded into the uh, program that performed the photometric measurements, which is Astro Image J, by the way, and you can download that for free. Uh, 
yeah, I don't think my photo is really all that bad of quality. I mean, I did just use my, my SLR camera here on a tripod. I didn't go all out with a telescope because, in part, I wanted to demonstrate how you can do this at home using equipment that a lot of people have. Uh, I used a telephoto lens, a 300 millimeter telephoto lens, and, a, and, a, and an SLR camera on a standard camera tripod. Uh, and took a shot of Venus and the Moon. And yes, Venus is a pinpoint here. Deliberately, I'm not trying to massively overexpose Venus. Yeah, I could do that if I wanted to, and it would look probably prettier from an aesthetic point of view, but it's important here when you're doing photometry for one thing, to try to keep things within the dynamic range of the camera, you know, within the linear response range of the camera. This is important, and this is one of the reasons why CCDs and uh, cameras like SLRs and of course, astronomical CCD cameras, they're so much better than the old film days because with film, with photographic film, you don't necessarily have an, a linear response to light. In fact, you almost never have a linear response to light, meaning twice the number of photons results in, you know, two times the signal on your, on your film emulsion. That doesn't really work like that usually, especially for long exposures. With CCDs, you have a much more linear response and you can basically count the number of photons coming in. Now, a number of things influence the number of photons coming in, right? You do have things like the aperture of the camera, the exposure of the photograph, you know, how long did you expose it for? These are all important variables. And so simply by changing the aperture of the camera, you can change how bright the image is. Sure. Simply by changing the exposure time, you can change how bright the image is and how bright Venus looks in the image. Sure. This is why you have to measure it relative to a known source in the image. In this case, I picked the moon. It was handy. Venus was next to the moon. The moon's quite bright. It shows up quite well in the photo. And we can measure the relative brightness of Venus to the moon. Now, again, keep in mind that uh, the videos that I was trying to address and the claims I was trying to address at the time generally stated that this wasn't even Venus. And so that's why the previous couple of videos I had done prior to this, this photometry were all about simply trying to identify this as Venus. And a lot of people were saying, it's not Venus, it's too bright to be Venus, etc. So the point of trying to do this video was, in large part, to demonstrate that, yes, actually, it's exactly as bright as Venus should be. I wasn't trying to address claims that the moon was also too bright, but we can address that. So I've already taken some pictures of Venus and compared it to a different object, one that is not in the solar system. And so the alternative to comparing it to, say, the moon or another known planet would be to compare it to a known star. And I did that using the eye telescope, uh, T11 telescope, this big monster, awesome telescope. You can rent it online, and uh, it's in New Mexico, and you can use it to do photometry. It comes with uh, photometric filters. You can pick uh, any of the UBVRI filters. These are designed for photometry, as a matter of fact. And so uh, I put on the V filter and took a shot of Venus and the bright star Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. And that star has an apparent magnitude of negative 1.46. So that's our known in this case. So here's the photo I took of Venus with the telescope. You can see the phase of Venus there. It's about half full, maybe a little more than half full at that time. And up here in this box, we have the actual measurement of its brightness. So there are two rows here. The top row is actually the row that corresponds to the photometry I did of Sirius, uh, which is this star here. And that gives you a value right here. This is the intensity of uh, Sirius in the image. And just like before, with my photometry of the moon versus Venus, these are arbitrary units. It doesn't matter what these uh, numbers really are. What matters is what the numbers are relative to each other. Because just like I said before, the amount of exposure that you have, uh, how, how big your aperture is, this all affects how bright the image will be. But what's important is to compare these two. They were taken with the exact same exposure, the exact same aperture, and in fact, I even timed these uh, pictures to be taken at a moment in time where Sirius and Venus were at the same altitude above the horizon. So in terms of atmospheric effects, you have the same amount of atmospheric extinction. You're looking through the same amount of atmosphere, and it was taken on a perfectly clear morning uh, where there were no clouds. So once again, the top row 
is the intensity of uh, sorry Sirius. The bottom row is the intensity of Venus, and also these values have been uh, comp are compensating for the brightness of the sky around these objects. So that's calibrated for as well, which is why it says source minus sky. Uh, the sky is measured in this outer ring. Uh, basically, you can see this donut shape around Venus, this outermost ring. That's where the sky is being measured. Same goes for Sirius. So that's measured and calibrated for in these measurements. So we can plug in these values now to calculate how bright uh, Venus actually was that morning. So intensity of the known, in this case Sirius, intensity of Venus, and the apparent magnitude of the known object, in this case Sirius. You plug in those numbers and you end up with an apparent magnitude of Venus of negative 4.08 that morning. Now, once again, we're going to use the dan the Dangent formula uh, that I showed from uh, my previous video. That old book from the night using observations. It's it's based on observational data from the 1930s. Plugging in the date and time and location of the observation, you can see the altitude of Venus here was just a little over 31 degrees, and the apparent magnitude expected was about negative 4.03. So it's within a few hundredths of a magnitude of what the brightness of Venus should be. And in terms of human vision, uh, the human eye is generally able to distinguish magnitude differences of about uh, a tenth of a magnitude by eye. And so it's right on where it should be according to the equation. Uh, and then let me see here, I've got one more sheet. This is an altitude azimuth calculator, plugging in the coordinates of Sirius and the time that the Sirius photo was taken which was basically at the same time the Venus photo was taken within a couple minutes of each other, uh, just long enough for the telescope to slew over and take a picture of Sirius. And it's also 31, just a little over 31 degrees above the horizon. So that you're looking through the same amount of atmosphere, the same time, uh, and compensating for the brightness of the sky at each location. And the brightness of Venus is right on. We're not comparing here to any solar system object. We're comparing to a star far outside the solar system. And things are exactly as they should be. So you can do this right now. If you go out at the right time, actually you can time it so that Venus and Sirius are at the same altitude above the horizon, so you're looking through the same amount of atmosphere. You can repeat these measurements if you want. And you're going to find that Venus is no brighter than it should be. So have got quite a few viewers tonight. Uh, even in spite of the late hour, I want to see if uh, anyone has any particular questions, and uh, if anyone, you know, would like to, I'm willing to let anyone to come into the uh, uh, the hangout here uh, and ask me questions. So if anyone's feeling up to it, uh, I'm going to drop the link and uh, let people join. So I've got Gaz the cameraman here. He's going to help me moderate this chat. Uh, if things go sideways in terms of, you know, profanity, again, this is a family-friendly channel, guys, so let's try to avoid using profanity or anything uh, objectionable like that. But if someone tries to come in and troll it, I'm just going to have to cut the video here uh, and uh, re-upload it as a, as a separate upload without that, if you see what I'm saying. But I think we've covered all the major points that he makes in his, uh, in his video. So while anyone is considering joining or not joining, uh, I want to demonstrate something that I've been working on. And I've done a couple videos about this, but I haven't done one lately. And I'm still working on the software, uh, but I'm developing software for automated telescopic tracking. So I've got the tel telescope set up here tonight. And now you're going to see what these joysticks are really for. So I'm going to connect the telescope to my software and uh, do a little demonstration. So this is something I'm developing for tracking fast-moving objects, uh, satellites and rockets, and things like that. And I've got the telescope connected now. Joysticks are turned on. And basically, you have throttle here, joystick here, and I have full manual control over the telescope. So I can turn left, and go right. And the higher I set the throttle, the more responsive the telescope is, the faster it'll move. 
And I can also get it to auto track. So I've got a flashlight here. And I can just point that uh, at the at the telescope. And it will follow my light. Well, it's pretty impressive, I have to say. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to getting this out into the wild, as it were. I've still got some bugs to squash with it, particularly in terms of uh, satellite tracking. Ultimately, uh, it will uh, allow you to upload a, a file predicting where the satellite's going to be based on its orbit, and it'll start tracking basically what they call open loop tracking, just sending commands to the telescope and hoping the satellite is there. It'll get you pretty close to where the satellite actually is, and then you'll just be able to click on the window where you see the satellite in the video viewfinder, and it will center it up automatically and lock onto it. Uh, and then in terms of um, basically de novo tracking, it already does that quite well, which is what you just saw with the flashlight, where you don't have any idea of where the object is going to go or uh, you, you, you weren't expecting to see it, basically. You don't have any prior information about how it's going to move. But all you have to do is click on the object, and it'll follow it automatically. It's actually um, we're, it's actually doing that right now even better than it is in terms of trying to pre-track uh, satellites due to a bug I've got to work out. But um, it's getting there. It's getting there. And I've already got some videos with it tracking rocket launches. Works extremely well for that, um, day or night, really. Uh, there are some issues during the day occasionally if the rocket's exhaust is really bright and leaves a bright contrail behind, sometimes it can be dif difficult for the software to uh, distinguish the contrail from the flame. But in part, that's because I've got this really wide field camera on here. It sees a large section of the sky at once compared to, say, a telescope on top. Uh, and I do want to try uh, in the near future putting a, a guide scope. I've got an 80 millimeter guide scope like a lot of amateur astronomers would have, that I'll put piggyback on top there and try guiding through that instead. The disadvantage of that is if you lose sight of it in the guide scope, it's a lot harder to get it back into the guide scope uh, than it is with this uh, wide field camera. So there's going to be some tweaking I've got to do with it, but it's working pretty well. Um, and as far as I know, this is the only program currently in existence that allows for these particular features on this particular telescope. The Mead LX200 Classic uh, doesn't normally allow you to directly control driver rates. There's no um, command in the software API for the LX200 Classic that gives you direct control of the, over the driver rates. In other words, the ability to specify within the software telescope, I want you to move this many degrees per second in this direction, and this many degrees per second in this direction, and basically move along this vector. There's no way to tell it to do that directly. Um, and the newer telescopes, of course, have that capability. And so there is software out there for those sorts of telescopes. But not all scopes, even today, not all scopes support that kind of direct drive rate control. Uh, and so this software is really designed to circumvent that limitation and allow people like me with scopes that don't have that kind of uh, support to be able to do things like smooth joystick control and, and automated control uh, for fast moving objects. So uh, looking forward to getting that out there. Uh, and I know some people have been asking about it, the people who have been following my channel for a while, but it's been a while since I've done a video. And I know I've got a lot of new subscribers here that might be watching tonight or watching the replay of this. So I just wanted to to recap that and uh, let you guys know what I'm doing behind the scenes uh, when you're, you know, when you don't see me uploading videos, I'm probably working on this. So are there any uh, questions hanging out in the chat that are pressing? I see the usual question about uh, why is Venus much brighter than normal, which seems to be the perception out there. And this has been addressed in recent videos uh, by Astronomy Live and also by myself. And I think that one of the, the points that people are overlooking as well is, is that um, Venus is, is back in the same position in the sky about every one year and seven months from any, any particular point. So. Last time Venus was in the Northern Hemisphere sky in the evening, it was actually uh, summertime, and it is currently wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere. 
So your sky in the northern hemisphere is much darker, therefore the contrast between Venus and the background sky is a lot greater. So I think it's fair to say that Venus is going to look a lot brighter against a very dark winter sky than when it is during the summertime in the evening sky as it is down here in the southern hemisphere where Venus is also very bright but it's also against a fairly light um, sort of twilight background sky. Astronomy Life? Yeah, that's a great point. And also along that same uh, line, I see a lot, I, not, I don't see it in the chat right now, but I have seen a lot of comments in the last couple of weeks of people uh, with the misconception that because Venus has a fast orbital period of less than a year, that it shouldn't seem to hang around in the sky for as long as it has. Uh, and that's because of the difference between its sidereal period and its synodic period. So in terms of the orbital period of Venus, yes, it's less than a year, but as you just said, it, it actually lingers in the sky for a long period of time in part because it takes a long time for it to come back around to the same position relative to Earth and the Sun. And that's because we're also going around the Sun. So yes, its orbital period is less than a year, but our orbital period is only one year. So it takes about, what did you say, 18 months? I think that's about right, 18, it's a, I think around 18 months. Yeah, yep. 18 or nine, yeah, 18 or 19 months for it to come um, back around uh, and reach the same position relative to the sun in our sky. And that's, as I said, that's because we're not a stationary object. We're also going around the sun. So it takes a lot longer than people expect uh, for Venus to move out of the evening sky and into the early morning sky and vice versa. Um, but I also notice that you tend to see, at least in my experience, you tend to see a lot more people noticing Venus and, you know, think, you know, perhaps for the first time in a long time, uh, and thinking that it's brighter than it has been when it's visible in the evening hours. I don't see too many people pointing it out when it's visible in the morning hours, even though I may be frequently up, you know, in the early morning hours doing some, you know, satellite tracking or something. And I'll see Venus when it's visible in the morning hours and think, wow, that's really nice and pretty and bright. But uh, I don't tend to see too many people noticing it then. And I think that's that's going to be the case a lot of times because the observers who tend to stay up all night watching the sky, you know, amateur astronomers, serious amateur astronomers who do, you know, all night sky imaging runs and uh, just visual observing in some cases, they're quite familiar with this because, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I know you've probably been doing it even longer than I have. And, you know, we've, we've all been doing it for a long time. And, you know, when I go to Chiefland, I'm usually one of the youngest guys there. And these guys have even you know, more experience than I have. And none of them think that the brightness of Venus is unusual. Not a single one of them. Uh, because, you know, they, they're just in the habit of seeing it all the time. It's nothing new. Uh, even when it's, you know, bright in the winter sky, it's, it's something we've seen on quite a few previous apparitions, but, you know, to lay people or people who are only casually involved in the hobby, it can be quite surprising, uh, how bright it is. And that's why it's important, I think, uh, to learn perhaps how to check this for yourself. You don't have to trust your own judgment and memory on it. You can check it ob you know, objectively by doing photometry on it. And photometry is a whole area of astronomy that is worthy of, its, of, of several nights worth of discussion on, on how to do it really accurately. Uh, if you get really deeply uh, involved in photometry, you can actually discover planets orbiting around other stars. There are amateurs involved in uh, transiting searches where you look for a very, very small change in the brightness of a star as a planet transits in front of it and blocks just a tiny portion of its light uh, for a period of time. And by looking for those regular dips, you can uh, find potentially new exoplanets. And so there have been exoplanets found using essentially off-the-shelf telescopes similar to this one, perhaps a little larger, but uh, very similar to the ones you'll see on the iTelescope network, for example. And you can use those telescopes on the iTelescope network to go hunting for entirely new planets that have never been spotted by humans before. So that's kind of, you know, it's kind of incredible what you can, what you can achieve if you really get into it. Um, the photometry I'm showing here tonight, you know, it's just basic, very, you know, crude using old figures for the brightness of Venus, but it's still good enough when compared to naked eye observations. Uh, and it doesn't take, you know, a terribly uh, expensive setup to actually start to get into it, really. Uh, even an SLR will allow you to start to get involved uh, with photometry, although there are more limitations when you're using 
uh, an off-the-shelf SLR camera. One of them, of course, is the fact that you don't have direct control over the temperature of the camera, the CCD. Uh, and that's why it's important, like when I did the comparison of Venus to the moon, they were both in the same exact shot. And that means that the, t the temperature of the CCD was the same when measuring Venus and the moon necessarily because they were in the same shot. With Venus and Sirius uh, that I showed earlier from my telescope, uh, that's not an issue because I'm using an astronomical CCD there that is being held at a very, very set fixed temperature. Uh, it's actively holding a temperature that's actually several degrees, quite a few degrees below zero uh, Celsius. It's at a sub-freezing temperature and it's held at that temperature precisely so that the conditions on the CCD are exactly the same uh, between multiple pictures. And that's very important when you get into high, uh, high precision photometry. Uh, you know, such as looking for exoplanets and the like. You want to be able to control all those variables very precisely. So uh, that's that's sort of the thirty thousand foot overview. But I think I think you know that's hopefully helpful to people to realize that it's not something unusual. The brightness of Venus is what it's supposed to be, even according to equations that have been around you know longer than NASA. Okay, now just. Getting back to the questions about how bright Venus is. Um, now, there's some questions about uh, when is is bright when is Venus going to be at its brightest? I wonder, Astronomy Live, are you able to pull up your starry night just in the background there? I remember the other day when I tried to share it, uh, it wouldn't wouldn't um, show on the screen share. I wonder if yours might come up so that you can actually show the uh, the orbit around the sun. Uh, visually, that will give people a better idea of actually what's going because all we see when we look at Venus in the night sky is, is basically a, a two-dimensional view, but of course we can use the astronomy software to get a three-dimensional view and understand what's actually going on as it's rounding the back of the sun, coming around and heading towards us. Um, just while Astronomy uh, Live is, is pulling that up, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, when I don't actually have starting out on this computer. I do have Stellarium, so I can show that real quick. Uh, is that okay? Can I you guess show the orbits for Stellarium? Um, only from the perspective of Earth, not like an overhead view, like you can with the Starry Night. Uh, that's what I wanted was the orbit from the the observer's viewpoint on the Earth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we can see your screen in the Hangout, so that's good. And actually, I'm sorry, I got to pull that off for a second because I just realized, yeah. Uh, that shows a location I don't want people to know. I don't want people to know exactly where I live. Sorry. Uh, let me just pull up a random location here so that it's not... Uh, you couldn't really see it because my taskbar was in the way, but I, I, I realized I forgot to turn that off before sharing the screen. So, Right. Now, Venus is going to be at its brightest from February 16th to the 20th of February UTC at an apparent magnitude of minus 4.63. Um, now, it's not at its brightest when it's at its closest. There's quite a complicated combination of things going on with the, the actual uh, phase of Venus because it has phases just like the Moon does. Uh, you've also got the amount of area um, that is in sunlight and you've also got the distance away from the Earth. So all of these factors come into play. Come on. We've almost got it here, I think. Uh, okay. Are you able to see it okay? Uh, we could see your screen, but we're back on camera with you at the moment. Oh, okay. Okay. That didn't work. Uh, let's try that. Hmm. Keeps getting the taskbar in the way there. Okay, there we go. Now it should work. All right, so it's been a while since I've played around with Stellarium in any detail, but show planets orbits. There you go. Is that what you wanted to see there? Yep, that's right. So if you can um, bring this back in time so that, that we can see what's been happening over the past few weeks and months, um, we can check the position okay. of... Venus and um, and see from around the back of the sun 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Date and time window. Let's move this off here. Okay, so we're going backwards in time at the moment, and you can see that Venus is um, heading back around the, the, the back of the sun as, as we watch this in reverse. So this is obviously in the daytime sky with the sun high in the sky. So if you just stop it there, okay, okay. so we've, we've got Venus very close to the sun, um, so it would be pretty much impossible to see Venus um, just after sunset uh, at this distance from right. the sun. But as we run yeah. it forward, we can see that, that Venus progresses along that back side. It's heading out towards the left until it gets as far out to the left as it can go, which is called greatest elongation. And then it starts heading around towards us. So it's actually still coming towards us. Uh, we'll get back to today's date very shortly. I can't see the date on there clearly at the moment, so it looks like we're still in 2016. And actually, let me uh, let me present my view. I just realized while you were talking, it was probably showing your avatar instead of my view. So now it should be uh, holding on to my view, uh, even when you talk. So yeah, we're now into February of 2017, and you can see it's past greatest elongation now. Uh, but it's continuing to get closer to us as it approaches us on the nearer side of its orbit. And actually, let's see, somewhere in here, yeah, there's the distance. This line right here shows the distance. It can be hard to read, but it says 0 0.345 astronomical units. So it's continuing to get uh, closer even as it, uh, the phase angle, of course, is going to make it uh, a thinner and thinner crescent. Let me back it up here to uh, mid-January, where it's at greatest elongation. And you can see the apparent magnitude here is extincted to negative 4.27. And then it's continuing to get brighter. It's continuing to become a more negative number, uh, even though the phase angle is going to continue to shrink. It always reaches its brightest point when it's a crescent phase. That is expected. And if you look at uh, the formula for the magnitude of Venus, again, you can pull that out of the, the same book I did, which, you know, the equation predates NASA. It's a, competing it's a competing function of both the distance of Venus and the phase angle of Venus. So yes, as the phase angle is getting smaller, uh, the, the brightness of Venus should decrease, but the overriding factor becomes the distance because every day it's getting closer to us. So here in mid to late February, uh, the distance is about 0.4 astronomical units, you know, farther from us than it is, say, in March. So it's it takes a while for that phase angle to become the dominant factor. At a certain point, that magnitude will start to increase in number, meaning it'll get dimmer. So as you can see now, as I as I go forward each day, the magnitude is actually getting dimmer. That's because that phase angle is shrinking and the, and the crescent of Venus is getting smaller and smaller. But until it reaches about mid-February, uh, I think, uh, it's going to continue to get brighter each night. So let me back it up again. You know, here's mid-January. And as I step forward, it's continuing to get brighter even though the phase is decreasing. So right around here, around mid-February, is where you hit the brightest point. And if you look at it, when it's at that brightest point, let me center up on it and zoom in. It's actually a crescent phase, and that's expected. And it's not just Stellarium saying that. I mean, like I said, you can reference this. You can look at the references for this that predate the existence of NASA, and it still gives you the same answer when you plug in the numbers. So, yeah, I think that's uh, hopefully helpful to people. That they can start to visualize how these things move and, and why it looks the way yes, it does. Being, being able to see the orbit in the sky around the sun there, um, because you know in the evening sky we just see these planets as as blobs of light in the sky, and we've we've got no reference point as to where they are in the orbit, what the relationship is to the sun. But at least using these astronomy Absolutely. programs, we can bring up the orbits, we can check the phases, just as you're showing now. 
actually see what's going on. We can see how, how Venus is actually facing the sun. That's the illuminated side of the planet. And uh, of course, yep, it works absolutely. just the same as, as with phases of our moon. Exactly right. And because we're viewing here from an altitude azimuth perspective, which is the way most people look at the sky when they just look up at the sky naked eye, you're looking at it relative to the horizon. And when you do that, uh, you're subject to field rotation. And so if you look at it from a polar line perspective, it won't look nearly as tilted. And that's because from a polar line perspective, you don't have to deal with field rotation. And you're now parallel with the Earth's axis of rotation, which itself is not actually perfectly uh, orthogonal to the ecliptic, right? Our, our, our axis of rotation itself is tilted about 23 degrees from the ecliptic. Uh, the ecliptic plane, but it gives you a much better view here of Venus looking, you know, not nearly as tilted, and you won't get field rotation over the course of the night. Here you will, when you're viewing from an altitude azimuth perspective, if you were to view Venus over the course of the day, if I back up time just over the course of this day here, you'll see it looks like it tilts over the course of just this, of, of the day from rising to setting. And Venus is so bright, it can actually be seen in the daytime. Uh, a few years ago, back in 2011, I actually did a webcast, a live webcast of Venus uh, during the middle of the day and watched it into the evening. And you could see it uh, during the middle of the day. If you know right where to look for it, you can actually spot it with the, both your naked eye or, of course, a telescope as well. So I did a telescopic webcast uh, back in 2011 of Venus during the day. And that's, you know, again, that's quite normal. And you can find references of that, too, uh, stories of that happening centuries ago. So uh, that's uh, that's nothing new. And a lot of people ask, so why is Venus this bright? Why is it the brightest planet? It's not the largest planet. No, it's not. But it's, it's basically one of the closest. And it's also highly reflective because it's completely enshrouded in clouds all the time. It's just, a, it's basically just wrapped with clouds that reflect uh, most of the light that hits it, or at least a large portion of the light that hits it. Uh, comes back our way. And so we end up seeing a bright, white, shiny planet uh, versus, say, a dusty red planet like Mars, which absorbs much more of the light that hits it, and it's smaller. Uh, so there you go. That's why Venus is the brightest of the planets in the night sky. And it's also brighter than any of the stars in the night sky. All right. So do we have any more questions? Let me just turn that off here for a second so I can access the chat. Don't see too many questions. Somebody asked that they thought Mercury was the closest planet to Earth. No, as a matter of fact, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, but uh, definitely not to Earth. Yes, Venus, How much for my... Venus is go, go and Mars is quite a bit further away than Venus is to the Earth. As we go out further, yes, and get further and further apart. Now there will, of course, be some times where perhaps Mars is temporarily closer to us than Venus is, such as the the 2003 close approach of Mars. Um, but you know, on the whole, uh, and at its closest, Venus is closest to us. So. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked how much my setup costs. Um, well, the telescope is an 8-inch LX200 Classic. That used to retail for about $3,000 back in the day. I think they're a little bit cheaper now because computer prices have come down. But generally, you're going to pay, be paying a, you know, a few thousand dollars for the telescope unless you're buying used. Um, I actually got this one on sale as they were phasing out the LX200 Classic model for the GPS models. Uh, the uh, cameras I use, it depends on the camera. This This camera up here is actually dirt cheap. This is a $100 Samsung security camera that's been modified for astronomy. Um, but uh, the main camera I use for deep space observing is a $3,000 SBIG ST2000XCM. They don't make those anymore either. That's an older older model camera, but it's still quite good. Um, so it depends on what you want to do exactly. You know, Certainly, you can just start off with the base telescope and, and add on accessories from there, and that's actually what I did. Uh, when I bought this telescope, the only cameras I had to go with it were old film cameras. The old, I had an old uh, Minolta 
uh, SLR, and I tried that with it briefly and then moved into digital photography. So uh, it's a pretty good setup, but you know, you don't have to have something quite this fancy if you want to get into astronomy. And really, I would recommend starting off with a good pair of binoculars and a sky chart and learning how to navigate the sky, learning how to see what's in a sky chart and correlate it to what you're seeing in the eyepiece of a binocular. Now, there was a question uh, about why the sun is a golden color at, at sunset or sunrise. And of course, oh, this sure. is due to the the way that the, the light has been split. I'm actually pretty tired and I feel like I'm starting to lose my voice. So I'll let you kick in there, uh, Astronomy Live, explain that one for us. Okay, yeah, and I'm, I need to hit the sack here pretty soon too. So I think this will be the last question for the night. But yeah, the, the reason the sun looks yellow uh, at sunset or sunrise, it's, it's mostly because of atmospheric reddening. So the more atmosphere you look through, the more blue light is going to be scattered by the atmosphere. It's the same reason the sky is blue, it's scattering blue light preferentially. Um, and so because of that, if you're looking through enough atmosphere, as the sun gets lower and lower on the horizon, you're looking through increasing amounts of the Earth's atmosphere. And eventually, uh, so much of the blue light will be scattered that the sun starts to look yellow and eventually even red as it approaches uh, the horizon. It's called atmospheric reddening, and this really applies to any astronomical object uh, as it approaches the horizon. It's the same reason the moon can look red as it's coming up uh, on a night, even when it's not a you know in a total sol or total lunar eclipse or anything. It can look red as it's approach as it's near the horizon, uh, simply due to that effect of atmospheric reddening. Uh, so. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite normal. And that's why it's important when doing photometry, for example, when I compare the brightness of Venus to, say, the brightness of Sirius, I check them in. I make sure that they're, I'm looking through the same amount of atmosphere both times. There are also ways to, to compensate for atmospheric reddening or at least calculate how much should be occurring uh, based on uh, how much air mass you're looking through. But for simplicity and uh, just to keep things equal, uh, in the case of my observations, I try to plan it so that... Uh, uh, what I'm comparing the object to is at the same altitude over the horizon, so you're looking through the same amount of atmosphere. Right. It should add, too, that uh, when, when you see contrails that are illuminated by the setting or rising sun, they will uh, change that fiery orange color. And sometimes people think that they're fireballs, meteors, uh, or even UFOs, but it, it's just that the sun is illuminating those contrails with that uh, brilliant uh, orange red color that we see at sunset or sunrise absolutely well, well i was looking you. at the moon in the sky uh, earlier today uh, middle of the day about uh, our last quarter phase and it, it just reminded me of when i was a young child w uh, walking to primary school and looking up in the sky and seeing the moon during the day and i find it interesting as a comparison uh, hearing people say that Venus is unusually bright and all this sort of thing. It reminds me of the number of people who happen to look up and see the moon in the sky during the daytime for the first time ever in their life. They see it and they think that there's something very strange going on. You know, they look at the moon and they say, that shouldn't be there. You don't see the moon during the daytime. Something's wrong. But of course, it's just that they've never noticed it before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm always sort of amused by that as well. I remember as a child, uh, back in the 80s, uh, seeing it for the first, noticing the moon in the, in the daytime sky for the first time as a kid, and not knowing anything really about astronomy at the time, you know, I wasn't into it yet or, or anything. I, all I knew is that there was this term that some, you know, some adult I had heard used, the blue moon, and I thought that's what that meant. It must have meant, oh, well, yeah, it kind of looks blue when it's out there during, during the day, and so for years growing up when I was a kid, I, I used to think blue moon meant seeing the moon in the, in the daytime sky. It wasn't until later. Uh, I realized it, it meant uh, two moons, you know, in a single month, the second moon. And then later learned that that was actually not even the original meaning uh, that was given to it, you know, in the Farmer's Almanacs. It was actually a misinterpretation uh, that Sky and Telescope made, apparently, many decades ago. So it took me quite a few years to learn the true meaning of blue moon. But I distinctly remember having the, uh, a misconception about it from being a kid and seeing the moon in the sky. So I think that will do it for this Hangout tonight. I'm going to wrap it up now, but uh, thank you guys for coming. And if you have any more questions, feel free to leave them in the uh, comment section. Uh, so I hope uh, that answers everyone's questions and certainly debunks uh, the notion that was 
of uh, Higher Truth Channel trying to debunk my measurements of uh, the brightness of Venus, which is still quite normal even when you compare it to non-solar system objects. So thanks guys for watching, uh, clear, clear skies folks, and I'll see you all soon.